so now, coming back to our headliner, uh, Han Jiang wanted me to just explain that she is four foot eleven and about 105 pounds, and then stop there. But I'm not going to. <laughs> she advises our startups. Uh, she's had over 20 years of experience with startups, helping build teams in HR, helping to raise money. Uh, she's fantastic, and she is going to talk to us today. So first of all, thank you for spending your lunch time with me. This is very special, especially since it's a sunny Friday. And we all know what happens when the weather is sunny in Seattle, right? We all call in sick and take the day off and go biking, hiking, or whatever it is that we love to do. So thank you for being here. So just to give you a little bit more before I go into my, uh, my talk so that you have more of a reference point, what I do is I focus on this area here, your head and your heart. As you transition from being a student, from being an entrepreneur, from uh, being a CEO to a team leader, there's a lot of stuff that happens between here and here. And I work with people to help them be able to personally scale. How do you grow this space here so that you can continue to grow and lead the company and build your business and create an event? So what I'm going to talk about today is my observations over the 35 plus years that I've been working. These are behaviors and mindsets that you guys have probably noticed in other people. And what, and then, you know, what happens when this is in play? So that's what I'm going to talk about today are these mental blocks that get in the way of you being in flow. And do you know what flow is? So picture yourself doing something that is creative, that you really love. You sit down, you start doing it, and all of a sudden, for you, time stops. And the next time you look up, instead of it being, you know, six in the morning, it's like five o'clock at night. But you feel so satisfied and content, right? That is the optimal way that we like to work. But these things, these, these things I'm gonna talk about, they actually get in the way of that. They get in the way of our ability to be in that space where we're creative and inventive and at our very best. So, in case you forget who I am, this is me. All right, the first thing I wanna talk about is called unmaking. And I call this unmaking releases you from past measures, expectations, context, criteria, perceived successes and failures to the future that makes room for new contexts and perspectives. And my, my question to you is what unmaking should you allow? And let me elaborate on this a little bit. We all come from some place. You're either coming from a senior project uh, in your master's or PhD program into a startup. You are an employee that is going from one job to the next, or perhaps you're transferring from one department to the next. Or perhaps you're a consultant and you are transferring from one um, company to the next, all right? We carry this, we all know the term luggage or baggage, right? We carry these expectations from whatever we came from to where we're going. And what happens is that it doesn't fit the context that we're moving to or the context that we're currently in. And so we continue to measure ourselves with expectations and we continue to look at who we are through these perceived failures and successes. And all it does is holds us back. But here's another piece to it. The other piece is that sometimes that's comfortable for us because where we're going has so much ambiguity that it's more comfortable to hang on to our previous successes and failures and expectations than to move forward. And what I'm inviting you to learn and to consider is this. You can't move forward if you're dragging something that belongs over there. You're not gonna be able to figure out how to be successful here if you're still measuring your success over here. Okay? And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. The next one is attention, right? We all know that what you pay attention to increases, right? But what kind of attention is that? Is that directed by external factors? Circumstances or situations, that is distract, distracted, non-productive energy. And then there's the focus of attention. That attention is being fully present each moment. That is a directed attention. That is a powerful, productive attention and energy, right? So, you know, if, if your day is 
is dictated by the emergency, right? If it's dictated by the phone that rings all the time, if it's dictated by your email, if it's dictated by you handling what's first and foremost in front of you, that is distracted energy. Because what happens is that once you, once you get rid of all those distractions, then you realize it's 6 o'clock at night, right? I can't go home to my family. I can't take care of this deadline that I have. And you wonder where all your time has gone. So when we think about whatever you focus your energy on grows, think about is it distracted energy or is it focused directed energy? And then another observation I made is about learning, that learning is iterative and concentric, right? There are these lessons that come around in different periods of our life, and they knock on our door. And first it's a raindrop, right? And then it's a spot of water in a little pond. And then it's a spot of water on the lake. And then it turns into a full-on like that, right? And the thing is that, that the longer we stop or the longer we try and forget the lesson that's knocking on our door, the bigger that it gets and the more that it impacts our life, right? But there's a comfort box. And when we're in our comfort box, it keeps us from learning. So my question to you is this. What's the lesson that you know is knocking on your door? Knocking louder and louder and louder. And it's something you need to embrace and learn. And if you learn it, it could help you with getting over whatever the block is. It could help you in running your company. It could help you making a, a very key decision. It could help you in leading your team because they probably know you need to learn that lesson. But because you're in your comfort box, you're not going to learn the lesson. And I want to talk a little bit about tools and templates. And I know in this room, when you say tools and templates, it can mean a lot of different things, whether or not you're in science or whether you're in tech, okay? So just, just bear with me. So tools are implements that facilitate an outcome. For example, capabilities, competencies, and talents. They're versatile, and they can be customized in application. And if they could talk, they can say this, I am capable, and I can figure it out. Templates are patterns, molds, and models. For instance, forms, processes, and systems. One size fits all. If they have a voice, they would say, I've done this before, and I can repeat it here. So they're both good. However, it's knowing how to use them and when to use them. So for example, you know, if you are doing something where it is new every time, and you have to tweak it every time, then of course you're going to use tools. But if you're doing something that's repetitive and, and now you're realizing you can do it over and over again and you need to bump the quality and the consistency, of course you're going to go to templates, right? It sounds very matter of course. However, here's the deal. We have a favorite. And what will happen is that we will apply that favorite even though it is really not working well, right? My invitation to you is this. If you're doing something with repetition and you need to have consistency, templates. If you're a tools person and you love being able to innovate every time you do something, but you're in a situation where it requires templates, you're going to have to make an adjustment or you're in the wrong place. Same thing is if you're a template person, and that's the way you work, you like to standardize, codify, cu and not customize, and you're in a situation where it is new all the time, you either need to bring a partner in or have someone on your team that can help you do that, or maybe think long term, do you belong in this space? The next one is triggers, right? What triggers you in your work, and what are the underlying beliefs in your triggers, and how are these beliefs taking you off course? So here's the situation, and it could be a thing or a person, but I'll give you the example of, of, of a person. So you're, inter you know, you're, in you're interacting with somebody, and they're typically a difficult person, and they treat everybody in their difficult way, but for whatever reason, it tanks you. You feel like, they have my number. I don't know how this person does it, 
but they got my number. Every time I'm in interactions with them, I walk away feeling small. I walk away and they've got the upper hand. Um, no, they don't. They have somehow become your trigger. Somehow you have assigned a value to that interaction, a value that's really about something in here, and not them, because they're treating everybody the same in their own rough way. So they're not singling you out, but you feel like you're being singled out, right? And so the question here is, what is that value you're assigning to that relationship? Because you probably continue to interact with that person because you need some something from them in a business sense or in a product sense. Or they're doing something and you need them to do their part so you can do your part, right? And the thing is to look at that. What, what is the value there? So here are some of the values that have come out when I have clients come to me about this. Is this is that I can't please them. No matter what I do, I can't please them. Right? I'm really loyal to them, but I don't get any signals back that they're loyal to me. Right? Those are values that have been assigned to that trigger. It has nothing to do with that person. It's the value that's been assigned. So how is that taking you off course? Look at your value that you're assigning to that relationship. All right, this is about energy. The question here is, are you busy on the hamster wheel? Here's the test if you're on the hamster wheel. Checklist activities. You can do whatever you need to do on autopilot, okay? Strategic. You gotta make decisions, okay? You gotta, you have to have a plan. Most of us would rather be busy than strategic because busy is easier, but strategic is what moves us forward. And if you're being busy, you're avoiding something most of the time. So if you're spending a majority of your time on busy, my question to you is what are you avoiding And here's the thing is uh, about being strategic is it takes time to think. And so some of the responses I have gotten is this, um, but I don't have time to sit down and, and be strategic. Where do you even start to be strategic, right? Put time on your calendar to sit and think. Because here's the thing, a lot of us feel that if we're not doing something, we're not accomplishing anything. But sitting down and giving yourself the ability to think, just think time, that is being strategic. Because here's the deal, and it's going to sound really counterintuitive. Ready? If you don't dream, you have no vision for your future. If you don't dream, you can't come up with possibilities. So putting that time on your calendar, sit and dream, and just think, that starts you to be strategic. Differentiation centered. How are you different? How have you built on this difference? And how are you stifling your difference? So when I was uh, looking for pictures for this, I was just cracking up, right? So there's that brilliant one, right? That foam with the solar, you know, can you imagine using that device? Wouldn't that be cool? You're on vacation, you just stick it to the window wherever there's sunlight and bam, right? Um, or how about this? I like this. Uh, the printer and the toaster all in one, right? And if you thought about the selfie stick, honestly, what was going through that person's head when they started developing the selfie stick? And what would be more fun is to be there as they were developing the selfie stick, right? Um, and then I love this. Um, you know, this I actually wish I had this little fan here, the cool, the ramen, right? Right? The point is this, is that everybody is different. I know it's a cliche. I'm not going to go all pink and rainbow on you. But every one of you is different. And if you're in here and you're an entrepreneur, you're even more different. And you know it. You know it explicitly. 
And there's one of two approaches that I have seen that entrepreneurs take is that you just accept that you're different. You don't question it because it's a can of worms. And, you know, you're just not going to open that box. You're just going to be different. You're going to do your thing. And you're going to create and invent and do whatever it is that you do best. Right? And you know you're not going to get, like, a great invention every time, but you're going to hit it. You're just going to keep – all you have to do is just keep trying. And then there's the entrepreneur that denies that they're different. It hurts too much. It's too weird to be different. They've been different for too long, and they just want to fit in. So what they do is they work overly hard to fit in. And in doing that, you actually stand out more. And you all know what that looks like, right? Um, like in college, I don't know why I'm going to tell you this story, but in college, right, I was surrounded by people with blonde hair and blue eyes. I love them. And I thought, you know, my hair isn't blonde, my eyes aren't blue, but I'm going to make my Asian straight hair feather like Farrah Fawcett's hair. <laughs> so I worked really hard at it. But the point here is this. You're differentiated. The more you stifle that, the more you trip yourself up. Because in your differentiation, in the fact that you see the world so differently, you come up with things that other people can't come up with because they don't see the world that way. And when you do that, you create something great. You do something great. And it may only be in your universe, but you make a difference. So sit in your differentiation. Be centered in it and allow it to express itself through you. Because if you have an ambition to do something bigger than yourself, to do something new, you're not going to do it by stifling your differentiation. What makes you different? The way you see the world. Let's talk a little bit about endurance and resilience. Endurance is, is standing up to the challenge. It's being resolute. It's tenacity. It's perseverance. It's resistance, actually. It's the oak tree, though, that snaps in gale force winds. Resilience is flow, move, change, push, flex, accept or eschew. It's the bamboo that bends in gale force winds and stands back up. And the question here is where do you live? So here's the thing. You need both endurance and resilience, right? You can't have one or the other. You've got to have both. But if you live in endurance, you're going to impair yourself. And, and so here's a couple of things for you to think about. Physiologically, our body is only made to stand 20 minutes of stress and then have several hours of rest, three to five hours of rest. When you live in endurance, you actually are putting your body under stress that whole time. And when you do that, your body doesn't get to flex between the different hormones, you know, the ones that you've heard, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, blah, blah, blah. Instead, it lives in cortisol. So why is that important? Because you guys are all living in, in that endurance. You're planted. You're going to get through this, right? Here's what happens. It affects the quality of your decision-making. It affects the quality of you seeing opportunities and options in your environment and on the horizon. It affects your ability to productively and empathetically interact with other people. And if you want to test yourself, check your attitude when your phone isn't going fast enough. Check your attitude when your teammate isn't answering their phone. Because most of you here are living in endurance and not in resilience. Resilience is this, you play all out, and then you pull back and you recover. And when something is coming at you, you make a choice. I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to flex with it. But always it's a thing of pushing and pulling and moving and swaying. It's not a mindset where you plant your feet and you're going to do it come hell or high water. And then you stand there and you do this for days and weeks and months and years. Because it actually impairs you to, to live in endurance. But in resilience, you have options. And you have rest. 
And something else that you should think about is this, is that if you work closely with other people and you guys are going through something together and you're the person that lives in endurance and they're the person that lives in resilience, you're going to make judgments about them. And I invite you to think about, are they handling this in resilience or are they handling this in endurance? And how am I handling this? Perhaps you're the one that's in resilience and they're the one that's endurance. And if you want them to continue on the journey with you, help them to move to resilience. So kryptonite. Uh, I think everybody here knows who Superman is, right? I mean, this isn't going to date me, like for the fair faucet major comment, right? So, you know, uh, kryptonite was, is Superman's, like, it throws him off. He can't work or anything like that. It weakens him. So the question for you is, which are your relationships are kryptonite? And when you're in relationship, which one are you? Are you fuel or are you kryptonite? Right? So except for when you are by yourself in the bathroom, everything we do is in relationship. You can't get anything done unless you're in relationship with another person. Right? But what is the quality of the relationships that you have? Are you in relationships due to obligation, but it completely drains you? Are you in relationships because of loyalty, and it completely drains you? And if you're an entrepreneur, that question actually has a bit more catalyst behind it. If you have people on your team do, due to obligation and not to what they're performing or what they can contribute, and they would be more productive in another environment, but you're not telling them that because it's obligation, but you know it's not working, do them a favor and be honest with them. If you're doing it out of loyalty, do yourself and that person a favor and have a straight conversation with them. And then if you're the kryptonite in someone else's life, understand how much courage it takes for them to have that conversation with you. I'm telling you, you're going you're gonna to swim or sink. You're going to be successful or die by the relationships you have. And you can't afford to be a friend to everybody because you only have so much time and they only have so much time. So be wise about the relationships that you have and be honest and have integrity in those relationships. Decisions are intention. They are an aggregate of small steps. Where are your small steps leading you? And if the trajectory isn't changed, what is your destination? See, here's the thing. We believe that there's this big decision. And once we discover that big decision or once we make that big decision, it's going to completely pivot what we're going to do, where we're going, and it's going to take us to this other place, right? actually false. Decisions are made by very small steps. You're making decisions in your work, little small decisions, and it's actually going to lead you in an aggregate fashion to the last decision that you make that will actually be the pivot. Okay? And the thing is, we all have intentions, and sometimes we're, we don't have enough courage to be honest with ourselves what that intention really is. And so we say this, but then we do this, and then we end up over here, and huh, I'm surprised I'm over here. But the reality is we've made small steps to get there. If you're leading a team and you're leading a company, you lack integrity if you're not intentional and honest about where your steps are taking the company, where your steps are leading your team. So my question to you is, where are you, where are you going? Where are your small decisions leading you? And are you going to end up where you say you're going to end up? And then this is my last slide. Success is not linear. I want to prove it to you. In order to have ideas, you've got to feed inspiration, right? What does that mean? It means something different for everybody. For one person, it's hiking in the mountains. For another person, it's doing art. For another person, it's burying their face in an algebra book. By the way, that would not be me. 
Um, if you're going to direction, you can read everything you want to read. You can talk to everybody you want to talk to. At the end of the day, you're going to take direction from your heart, your passion, or your gut. Right? Luck. What is luck? Luck is preparation plus opportunity times unpredictability. That's what luck is. Preparation plus opportunity and then unpredictability. How do you get insight? How do you get foresight? How do you see around corners? It's failure plus success times repetition. That's how you get there. And then last, relationships is people plus time investment. And there's actually one factor that's not included in that, and that is communication. Right? Relationships happen if you intentionally communicate, whether that's verbal communication or whether that's sign language or whether that's written communication. If you sit in this room and you think, uh, my body speaks for me, I have really great body language and facial expressions, and that's how I communicate with people, I'm going to tell you right now, no. I can sit across the room, and if I don't know you and I don't have a relationship with you, and you're making faces at me, it means nothing except that maybe you're psycho. <laughs> so remember that. Relationship requires communication. you got to talk in some form. Okay? That's it. That's all that I have. Any questions? So fuel is relationships that you're in, and when you're in that relationship or when you have that r person in your life, right, they totally propel you. They either, you know, give you ideas or they feed you, or they nurture you, or they somehow in some way help you to go forward, right? Kryptonite are the relationships where it cripples you to spend time with them, right? Spending time with that person, you walk away and you feel like you wasted your time, or you feel like they completely demotivated you, right? Or like they don't, they don't support what you do, or like they're always skeptical about what it is that you do. Now, Here's a little nuance, though. I have a person in my life. I see him once a year. He is somebody that is a highly accomplished uh, entrepreneur, angel investor, uh, senior CEO in some executive, uh, in some iconic companies, right? Uh, and, but I only see him once a year. And I know that every time I sit in front of him, he totally cares about me. And he will tell me stuff that I need to hear, but then he also tells me other stuff. The only thing is, it's kind of his language for me. It's kind of abrasive. But he's fuel for me because I know there's nothing behind that except for caring for me. And he tells me things that I, don't, I, that I won't hear from anybody else, and I'll hear from him. But he's still fuel. Kryptonize, you walk away and you go, oh, my God. And you know, sometimes it's our family members, right? Right, your favorite aunt. You have to make a choice. You might not be able to move them out of your life, but you can reprioritize what part they play in your life. Um, so that's actually, there's, there's several pieces to that. And so the first piece is the, the combination of the team, right? It's building that team and having an understanding that um, you want longevity in your company because the thing you have to know is that when that person walks out of your company, they're walking out with things in their head that you can't capture unless you can hook them up to the machine and, you know, and download it. And so choose your teams and choose the people that you work with wisely. That's the first thing. But the contradictory thing, too, is to understand that not everybody grows and wants to go and be you know, in like a 100-person company, 500-person company, et cetera, et cetera. So always be in communication about what does your what what does that person want for their life, and be in alignment with that. So that helps. The second thing is actually a thing. There's a white paper written way back in the day about above the water and below the water, and everybody has misquoted it. But what it says is this: when there are issues within a team, the first place you look at is goals, so strategy. 
Then uh, you look at the systems. Then you look at the process. And then you look at how it was defined. And then you look at relationship. We actually turn it upside down. And when there's an issue in the team, the first thing we go to is the person. And we don't work our way to the systems, the process, the goals, or the strategy until, we, matter of fact, most of the time we don't look at it. We just say it's that person's problem, right? And so having an approach that talks about let's make sure that we eliminate everything else before we eliminate that relationship with that person. So that's the second thing. The first thing is selection. The second thing is to make sure that the environment and things that are set up are set up for success. And remember that as you grow, especially in a startup, it is very fast. Systems and processes, you know, don't keep up. And then the third thing is it's about endurance and resilience. So some of you may have experienced this. Some of you probably have heard it from friends. A team is struggling. They go out and they do team building, right? They uh, climb trees. They do bowling. They drink beer, whatever it is. They go out and they do that. They have a fantastic time, and they're like, we fixed it. We've everybody has built a relationship. Woot, woot, we're going to go back to work, and it's going to be great. They go back, and they're great for like maybe a week, and then they're like back. So what has happened is that I would check the stress level of that team. You know, at first I would check the systems and the process, and I would actually check the stress level of that team. You know, what is the combination ratio of endurance to resilience, and how long have they been forced to work in endurance? And, you know, maybe what they need is not just a one-time team building, but maybe learning how to work with one another in endurance and resilience in those cycles, right? Um, I would check all of that first, and then I would, and then, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff, right? You can make sure that people are compatible and do all of that. But I think those three things at the forefront is really what you have to check. Because when people come together, their intention is to do something great, to have fun and to be with one another. Their intention isn't to be fighting or to be in this conflict. And so if they are, you want to eliminate first factors that is being overlooked and then work on the team building and the getting along because most people want to get along. You guys have given me an, a window to talk about, maybe go a little deeper with this, and it's this, right? We all have intention and ambitions about what it is that we want to do. And you wouldn't be in this room if, if that wasn't so. You wouldn't be making the sacrifices that you are and foregoing things that you're foregoing unless you were really serious about what you're doing. But life happens. And this, this is about helping you get through life so that you can continue to do what you're doing. But life still happens. It goes to your value system, believe it or not. It goes to what it is that you believe, right? So if you picture there's, there's two categories. There's one category called place. And then there's another category called ground. So place is like this. Place is your identity, your uh, role, your money, your credentials, um, the relationships that you have, the influence that you have. Place, ground. Ground is just you, nothing else. There's nobody else, it's just you. So if you are here in place, right, you're gonna endure. That changes and you can't give any of that up. And you have to like endure and plant yourself and get through everything so you can keep all of that. But if you're at ground and there isn't <laughs> anything else and it's just you buck naked the day that you were born, right, you don't have anything to lose. So then, you know what that does? It gives you freedom to choose. When things are coming at you, how are you going to handle it? It sounds tangential, but it is what it is. If you're in endurance and, and you find yourself, this is what endurance feels like. It feels like planting your feet and saying, come at me. I can do this. And you're standing there and, you know, crap is being thrown at you and you're tired and you're weak and you don't see your family and you haven't talked to you know, your mom and dad and you haven't you know, gone out and had lunch, you, know, you haven't done your laundry, but you're, you're going to endure, damn it. You're going to get through this no matter what, right? It's time to step back and say, <sighs> okay, 
what is so important about this? Is there another way to approach this? And what would happen if I just started with a 15 minute break? And I don't mean like you go watch TV for 15 minutes. I mean you give this a break for 15 minutes. Just give it a break. Whatever, whatever that means for you. If it is watching TV, go do it. Or if it's sitting in your room with no technology, go do that. But the most important driver for you is you gotta figure out what gets you out of endurance. To understand that being in that, you're actually, <laughs> you're actually hurting yourself. So let me say one more thing and then I'll, I'll let you finish. So there is this trend that's happening, especially with women. Do you know what the new logo bag is called? It's a new logo bag. A ton of women are, are wearing it. You know what it's called? I'm too busy. That's what it's called. I'm too busy, right? So, and then here's the interesting thing. These women don't put down this bag until they hit a major health issue. Then all of a sudden they realize this it bag, the I'm too busy bag, isn't worth it. It is a huge trend in women's health. That's part of endurance. I'm too busy. I'm going to endure this. Things at work are going to hell. I am going to stay there and take care of it. I'm going to work, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but it's going to take a lot of your time, right? And that is to actually find out what's going on with him. You, it sounds like you have a relationship with him, a friendship, a relationship where you guys can talk. In order to get someone out of endurance, find time with them. Start off with lunch because everybody has to eat or dinner, right? Everybody has to eat. Sit down with them and slowly help them peel back what is going on with them. What, what is it that they're believing that they're doing? And what is it that they believe that is so important that they are doing this to themselves and help them to just think about that you know y it's for somebody to transform they have to do the work but for you to ignite that transformation you ask questions that's the bottom tenet of coaching right i can't i can't transform you you have to transform yourself and i can help you do that by asking you questions questions that is based out of care and empathy so if you spend time with him and you help you ask him questions to help him reflect on what it is that's so important, what is it that he's believing about what he's doing, right? And help him to broaden his perspective. You will help him move, first of all, realize he's in endurance and then move to resilience. Do you know what I just did? I just did an, the introvert's trick on you. So there's introverts in the room, and the trick is this, is that when you're doing a talk, right, what you do is you don't just say, anybody have questions, and then walk off. You have to give them time, right? So you stand up here, and you do 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. You get to 10, and then if no one asks a question, then you say, so thank you so much for your time.